to be here. I somehow didn't expect that a science talk would draw 500 people in the morning <laughs> on Friday. Uh, the theme today is language. Um, as it happens, uh, I do not study language. I work at the Salk Institute. Um, I am a neuroscientist and I am a vision scientist. I investigate perception uh, using tools of computational neuroscience and psychophysics. And neuroscience is one of the three large themes at the Salk Institute, which are molecular biology and genetics, one, neuroscience, second, and plant biology, third. Um, I study perception, um, and to just give you a sense of what I will talk about uh, to, to wet our feet, I will do a little experiment. I'll ask you to answer a question. Uh, it will be a definitional question. And I'll ask you to, to please write down your answer. To write it down on a piece of paper or type it into your peripheral brain. It's important that you commit to it. All right, just get ready. Um, when you answer a definitional question, you want to start with a category. So if I ask you what a chair is, you'll tell me it's a piece of furniture. Uh, glasses are an optical device. Uh, maybe you don't need to answer the question uh, in a full sentence. Just write down the category, please. And I'll give you 30 seconds to think about it. My question is, what is space? Not the outer space, not the conceptual space, but this one, that I, the one I'm surrounded by. OK, so 30 seconds, please. Fifteen seconds to go. All right. I hope you all have an answer. Let me try just a few examples, please. Anyone? Possibility. Space as a possibility. Possibility being a category. Very interesting. Space as a possibility. Another one? Space as time, wow. That's, that's not what I think about, <laughs> huh. Thank you. Another one, maybe? Yeah, please. Um, as a relationship between me and others. As a, as a relationship, category is relationship, and it's a personal relationship, maybe social, social space that you have in mind. Well, I did this experiment a few times, and I, I discovered that uh, there are as many concepts or categories of space as there are people. And um, quite often, I get answers um, uh, from the category of nothingness. Because space is something that you can fill in when you put things in. There is nothing there. But when you put things in there, there is something. Um, quite often, we think about space uh, as a scientific category. We make it intellectual. And uh, we arrive at something like uh, the theory of relativity. Uh, it's uh, uh, the pinnacle of scientific uh, creativity, I think. Um, the notion of space-time. It's, it's an intellectual edifice of sublime scientific beauty, but it has nothing to do with experience. I'm going to talk today about experience of space. Not how we define it, how we think about it, but how we experience space. Now, one curious thing about space is that no one has ever seen it. Here is just one example from my literature. Uh, it's an old textbook from 1935 by uh, Harvey Carr. His definition is this. 
The term space, or space perception, is unfortunate because it suggests that space is something that we perceive, only objects are perceived. And these objects possess a number of attributes, qualitative, intensive, and spatial. The term refers to the perception of the spatial attributes of objects, that is their shape, size, stability, motility, and their distance, and directional locations in reference to each other and to the perceived subject. Space, as distinct from these spatial attributes, is a conceptual construct. It's a construct. It's something that we create as we look at objects. Space, as such, is never perceived. So when you, when you think that you see space, what you really see is something that your mind created. You are walking through your mind. Um, I tend to think that mind is not something that sits inside of your brain, because when you open the skull, you will not see anything that you would call mind. You see neurons, you see spiking activity of cells, you see this electrochemical processes. The mind uh, is not localized there. It's not really localized anywhere in space. The mind is out there. You are walking through your mind. I'm surrounded by mind. Um, to make this concrete, to go through different experiences, to build, to build a, little, uh, a little bit of momentum for thinking about space, I will walk you through a series of, uh, of uh, uh, something that may be called uh, representations of space. So uh, I'll make a three-stop progression, and then we'll see what we can learn about space by propagating ideas across this progression. So imagine you are in, a, in an art gallery. You are surrounded by works of old masters. In front of you hangs uh, this painting from uh, the Little Ice Age period by a Flemish artist. It's a beautiful scene. There are these dark trees and the hunters with their dogs uh, against this white, uh, against the snow and the roofs covered by snow. And uh, they form something like a theat theatrical apron. And just behind it, you see the two ponds, frozen ponds with the skaters uh, in flocks, and then, then you see another vast uh, uh, expanse surrounded by uh, rocky mountains. This sense of space is very strong. Your eye is fooled, even though you know that you're facing a piece of wood. It happens to be oil and wood, and you know there is a hard wall just behind that painting. You have a sense of space residing behind the wall. You want to move sideways, maybe to see a little bit more of that little dog behind the, behind the tree. The painting does not respond to your movement. Nevertheless, the sense of space does not collapse. It doesn't behave as a real space would behave, but somehow the sense of spa space is still, is still there. Well, this is what we call illusory space as opposed to the space in which you're in. Remember, you are in a print gallery, a painting gallery, you're surrounded by what you would call real space, and the space in the painting is not real, right? It's an illusory space. What's the difference? Maybe it has to do with what, what happens as you move. It's your motion and the reaction of the world to emotion that makes the space real or illusory. Remember, as you move, the space does not respond to you. Well, I can look around in the real space. There's a bench behind me, maybe. I could walk around it, and I can walk into a different room. That's real space. I cannot do anything like that in the picture. Now, suppose we changed our experience just a little and replaced the painting, the wood and oil, by a high-definition display, high electronic display. And suppose you had this tract. So your movements are recorded, and the display would show images that would correspond to what you would see if, it, if this beveled frame of the painting was really a window. If you looked around, if you looked behind the edge of the painting, you would see something else. You would see something that you didn't see before, and you could see around that, that trunk. This is the pictorial space, which is animated somehow, and this is just a few examples of how it was done by, by uh, Andrei Tarkovsky uh, is the same uh, wintry scene in his film Solaris and Mirror. This is an animated painting. Now, we arrive at our second stop in the progression of spatial experiences where you're beginning to have a sense of space as it is in reality represented on a flat surface. Still, you know that there is an illusory space of the animated painting 
and the physical real space that surrounds you. And the last stop is this. Let's uh, uh, suppose that you are in your living room or in your office and you're wearing the latest uh, snazzy head-mounted display and uh, you, uh, you run the simulation called painting gallery and uh, you, wear, uh, you wear all the tracking devices. Uh, now you remember that you're wearing this on your head. You're looking at the flat surface still. Essentially, we took that flat surface from our second illustration. We took this display, made it smaller, and strapped it to your head. As you look around, you could see the space from every direction. You could walk around that bench. You could walk into a different room. Every feature of the real space in the very beginning of spatial gallery is there. The real space now became illusory space because you know we are looking uh, through the glass. Perspective means looking through. It's a perspective representation of the flat surface. All this time you're looking at artificial representations through a glass. Nevertheless, you, you have the sense of being immersed, surrounded by space. Now, this is all very simple and clear and very familiar to uh, many of you today. Um, but I wanted to, to make this progression in order to, to show the connection that real space could be thought of as the next stop here on the progression that comes from pictorial representation, from the perspective representation invented in, maybe in Quattrocento, Italy in the early 15th century. So some lessons that we can draw from the art of perspective, of perspectiva artificialis, as it was called in the early days, as opposed to perspectiva naturalis, which was the science of optics. Maybe we could learn something about space from the painters, from the artists, because really we don't know what experiential space is. Some research has been done about properties of experience space, but this is very little. Today, as we enter the age of immersive realities, say in architecture, with virtual architecture, in, uh, in the cinema, in what we may call post-cinema, when instead of uh, sequences of shots, we are going to be immersed in, uh, in, 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 in uh, cinematic experience. Now we need to understand space. The technology is here, but our conceptual understanding is rather weak yet. So experiments like this, trying to think about lessons from the arts and thinking about space, I think uh, it's one way to go. So uh, a few things about, about perspective. Now, I'm here. This is mostly artistic audience. Uh, this is all very basic for you, but let me, let me go for this still. So here is one of the uh, important paintings from just before perspective was invented, from Trecento by, uh, by uh, Duccio, an artist famous for his attempts to create three-dimensional representations and to paint um, uh, people in architectural settings like, like it is here. And uh, let, let's just uh, take a few few examples. So uh, what you can see is um, um, the ceiling beams converging at some point here, right here. I hope you can see the two faint blue lines. Uh, then there is this uh, book stand. You see these two lines are parallel. They don't, the two lines do not converge here. Uh, then we have this um, little seat and the, there are these uh, pilasters. Um, you see these lines they converge all in different locations. It's as if there are multiple three-dimensional subspaces that don't talk to one another. They coexist in, in some space, but there is no any conceivable logic to it. It's an attempt to create a three-dimensional representation, but there is no real full space here. Now, when you jump forward to a post, uh, post invention of uh, perspective, this is uh, Archer's shooting at St. Christopher by uh, Andrea Mantegna from uh, middle 15th century. Here, I didn't draw the lines, but uh, it's, I think it's quite obvious that if you, if you try to do that, you will discover everything is consistent. So every part of this painting is speaking to every other part. And they, and they talk to one another. Different parts of the painting over long pictorial distances, they speak to one another. And this, to me, brings to mind the concept of field field as it is used in physics. The idea of field was used to introduced in physics uh, to capture just that, to capture the idea of action at distance, something that was not conceivable using prior concepts in physics. So here you have a field-like structure which is unified. 
So this is the first lesson, I think. First lesson we could draw from pictorial representation, uh, representations of space, so it's called lawful unity of space. And the second one is reign of perception. Now, given the machinery of uh, central projection, you could make correct representations of space that are unified, just like we saw, but that's, that's not enough. And there are many examples of that. There are just two. When you draw multiple cubes and the normal perspective in uh, and the oblique cubes coming from the center here in different directions, uh, the farther they go from the center, the more distorted they look. Even though uh, the representation is correct, all these cubes are drawn correctly uh, in perspective, but in the periphery you start seeing them distorted, quite obviously. Look, look at this one, for example. The same happens for uh, sp spherical objects. Uh, the farther you go from the center, uh, the more distorted they are. This is just one example uh, explored in great depth by uh, Michael Kubovi in his wonderful book on this subject called The Psychology of Perspective and Renaissance Art. I, I recommend you, you consult it. Uh, here what Michael says in the end when he discusses many digressions from correct experience in perspective. Geometry does not rule supreme in the land of perspective. In fact, if in the land of perspective, geometry plays a role analogous to the role played by Congress in the United States, then perception has the function of the Constitution. Whatever is prescribed by the geometry of central projection is tested against it, its acceptability to perception. If a law is un unconstitutional, it is rejected and must be rewritten to accord with perception. So there are these two principles that I think we can draw uh, from this progression. One is the lawful unity, field-like property of space, and second is reign of perception. So what you want to do, if you want to understand experiential space, is to figure how it changes smoothly from location to, to location, like it happens in a field, and we want to do it in a way that agrees with perception. We want to construct perceptual fields. Before I proceed with this idea of perceptual field, I just want to show our trajectory in this uh, uh, in the space of uh, uh, really huge space of visual visual arts. Here I just divided them to static or dynamic and uh, I differentiated between single point of view and multiple points of view. Um, here is perspect perspectival painting and it's static and offers a single point of view. Here is my responsive window where you could have multiple multiple uh, angles on it, that it's in a, it stands on the boundary between single point of view and multiple points of view of immersive window, immersive window which is strapped to, you, to your head. Um, I want to show this uh, little diagram just to indicate what experiences I did not include in my progression. Cinema, cinematic window is not a part of it because in cinema, everything that happens in cinema is in the pictorial space, just like in that wintry scene. We add motion to it, but it's not the kind of motion that we have in the immersive window. Uh, and here there's another interesting cell, uh, which is static and offers multiple points of view. One brilliant example of that is Cubist paintings. Here is uh, one precursor of Cubism by, by Paul Cezanne, when in a static painting an attempt is made to represent a single object from multiple directions. Here is another example, which would not be called Cubism, Maybe it's magical realism by, by M.C. Escher. This is an example uh, to create immersive experience on a flat surface. I'm sure you saw this before. It's called print gallery. Here is the entrance to the gallery. Here is the person looking at a, at, at a print. And if you go up, you see maybe a part of the print. You see this, uh, this, this boats, the, the buildings. If you proceed clockwise, you see these buildings. And here's this lady sitting above the roof, and here is the entrance to the gallery. And here you walk into the gallery, and you arrive at that person looking at that boat, and etc. So this is an example of creating an immersive experience in two-dimensional two settings on just a surface. Today, with immersive reality, we can fulfill the dream of, of Cubist painting, paint, painters and uh, artists like that because we could be immersed in so many different ways. Uh, but let me focus now on just one. So remember, I spoke about the challenge to describe experience as a perceptual field. Now, several attempts were made to do that. One of the most interesting comes from Gestalt psychologists. Gestalt psychology was a school of, uh, of uh, 
of psychology created in the second decade of 20th century in Germany and Austria. Uh, Rudolf Arnheim uh, wrote uh, extensively on experience of art. He was trained in Gestalt psychology in the early days. Then he moved to, he was trained in Germany, then he moved to, uh, to Italy, England, and ended up as a professor of art practice uh, at Harvard. Uh, this is a drawing by Italian architect Paolo Portoghese that uh, Arnheim used in the beginning of his book called The Dynamics of Architectural Form. It's an attempt to capture exactly what I was trying to describe, perceptual field. See what he says. In perceptual experience, the spaces surrounding buildings and similar structures cannot be considered empty. Instead, the spaces are pervaded by visual forces generated by the architectural structures and determined in their particular properties by the size and the shape of their generators. Visual forces are not isolated vectors, but must be understood as components of perceptual fields that surround buildings. And this is an attempt to capture that. So think of this solid uh, heavy lines as, uh, as uh, parts of a built environment, maybe walls, and these uh, circles represent sort of the forces or maybe areas where you would have different experiences. So to retrace my steps, we thought a little bit together about space as a linguistic category and as experience. We used a progression of special experiences to explore space as experience. We drew two lessons from, from this exercise. And now I think we are ready to, to try and imagine what this field, by sort of uh, predicted by Portuguese and Anheim, could look like. So we want to construct a solid sensory field for architecture and cinema, just as two examples. Now, how to do that? And here I'll bring a little bit of my science. Let's start from something uh, like this. It's a, maybe uh, not too typical, but a standard view of uh, an urban scene. That's a picture from Venice. Now what you notice immediately that the density of, of details of the painting, of, of this photograph, is different. So here, for example, these vertical elements of, of, this, of this photograph, they are spaced differently than there. The farther you go, the higher density of detail. And also you notice that the contrast is a little lower. It's a very typical feature of a photograph or painting or any kind of realistic projection, that the density of detail correlates with distance and the contrast also correlates with distance. Now, when we study things like that in the laboratory, we tend not to use photographs of Venice. We use uh, uh, this um, so-called uh, luminous gratings. You could think of them as visual atoms, the elementary components of any, of any complex scene, any complex image. And here we can vary these gratings in terms of density of detail, just like in that picture. So this is the dimension of density of detail from low density to high density. And you could think of that in terms of size. This is the size of the detail is large, and here it's small, and we vary contrast, just like in, in that, uh, in that uh, photograph, from low to high. Now, to put it all together, uh, we are going to see how, in general, visibility of patterns, the ability to see things, to see them at all, depends on the density of visual detail. This is a chart, which is called a contrast sensitivity chart, where you see the density of detail changing from low to high along this dimension. We call this dimension spatial frequency. Frequency is a sort of a measure of, how, of repetition, how often thing repeats itself. We lost connection to San Diego Library. <laughs> I apologize about this destruction. Let me see. Here. OK. So this is the dimension of spatial frequency. This is the dimension of contrast. Now, I'll ask you to find, to find, uh, San Diego Library is still here. OK. Uh, to find, for every horizontal location along this dimension, find the spot where you stop seeing this, uh, this grating, the boundary between visible and invisible. So for me, from this distance, and it will differ for everyone here, depending on your distance from the screen, here the boundary is going up, 
and he's going down. This is uh, one illustration how your ability to see things depends on the density of detail. So you, you need different amount of contrast to make this element of the photograph visible at all. So this is this boundary, uh, just schematically drawn, it's called contrast threshold, the boundary of visible and invisible. Um, so this is, this area is visible and everything, I'm, so, I'm sorry, and everything outside, and everything outside of it is invisible. So if I took a little visual atom, that grating, and move it away from you, so suppose you're standing here and you're looking at the screen where a grating is painted, maybe at this contrast, not very high contrast, and I move it away from you. So according to this, uh, the chart of visibility, according to density of detail, uh, we're going in this direction. As you, as you remove the grating, its projected density becomes, becomes higher and higher. It's as if I'm moving from left to right. So if I was at this level of contrast, and this is a, the single scientific moment here in my talk, okay? So please bear with me. <laughs> so as you go along this line, right? From low density of detail to high density of detail, here, from low density to high. So here it's the domain of invisible. You don't see anything. Here you see it, and here you don't see it. It's very simple. So it means that if you, if you take this grating at certain contrast and move it away from you, there will be part of space where you cannot see it, a part where you can see it, and then again you cannot see it. So you can think of a region in space. You would call it solid region because it's three-dimensional, volumetric, where you can see it. As if there is a little chamber there. If you get there, you can see things. If you get outside of it, you cannot. So this is the beginning of a new conception of space, I think, uh, where you could, you could imagine it as not just empty, not a, va not a vacuum. It's, it's, it has a structure. It's like an invisible palace. It has many rooms, or chambers, and you can work for them. And if this model of experience works, then we can map it out for any settings, for any uh, built environment, or for immersive environments. So just to illustrate, suppose you are a motorist, and this is a view of a city from above, um, and here are two buildings with white star and black star, and here is the highway and you're driving, right? So these rings represent the regions of visibility. Remember, when you're close to it, you cannot see it. When you're far from it, you cannot see it. So what you can see, I mean, locations from which you can see that building represented by the dark star is that ring. And here is another building represented by the white star, and that's the ring for that building. So as you drive through the space, there will be regions where you see one building and not the other, vice versa, and also regions where you can see both buildings. And if, he, if the model was correct, we could just take the intersection of these two rings and predict where you could see both buildings at the same time. So as you drive along this highway, there is this one chunk and the other chunk for which you could see both buildings. So here's an attempt to, to map out the space conceptually, uh, schematically. The question is whether the model I started with holds. So here I come to the specific project I did two years ago. It was a collaboration with architects and production, a production designer in cinema. Um, and the, the environment that created this opportunity was the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture. The Academy, was, it started here in San Diego uh, some 12 years ago. A number of forward-looking architects and neuroscientists came together and they put together this mission, which is to promote and advance knowledge that links neuroscience research to a growing understanding of human responses to the built environment. Uh, they created a grant program uh, three years ago, no, four years ago, which is called Hay Grant Research Program, which is designated to encourage neuroscience architecture cross-disciplinary research that contributes to a body of knowledge informing building design, incorporating principles derived from neuroscience research. Uh, the inaugural uh, uh, president of uh, uh, of the Society San Diego Library, uh, put it this way. Uh, the discipline of architecture has deep roots in ancient traditions that seek to optimize human responses to the built environment. 
Modern neuroscience takes this quest to a new level. Using a variety of powerful experimental approaches, we can begin to evaluate and optimize the built environment by exploring its influence on brain systems for perception, memory, and emotion. For centuries, architects were talking about human response. Now we are in a position to study human response using tools of neuroscience and psychophysics. Uh, that's what I do. And this experiment uh, that we did just now with these gratings, it's an example of how a psychophysicist thinks about human response. So uh, a team uh, of uh, uh, artists and scientists that we put together for this study included Alex McDowell. Um, he's a production designer. Uh, you may have seen some of the films that he worked on. Minority Report uh, is a prime example. Now he's a professor of art practice at the USC School of Cinematic Arts, uh, where he created a world building laboratory. Uh, to Alex, the present is defined by visual narratives that are screen based, that are based, that are, um, this is the case where the spectator is static. Today and in the near future, Alex is trying to, to uh, turn the screen into a window through which you can walk. Remember that progression, uh, you move from, uh, from a pictorial or cinematic window into the immersive space. This is the future for Alex. Another member of this team was an uh, architect, uh, Greg Lynn uh, from UCLA. Uh, to Greg, present is defined by excellent insight into spatial character of buildings. Indeed, uh, we spent centuries figuring how to represent buildings on flat surfaces. The future to Greg belongs in developing an equally advanced insight into dynamic character of buildings. Now, it's universally agreed that our experience of built environments is dynamic as we walk or drive through them, but understanding exactly how how to create this experience for dynamic, dynamic uh, mobile observer is a challenge. That's the challenge uh, for architecture of the future. And here's the vision scientist uh, of the Salk Institute. Uh, to him, the present was defined by what he calls full maps of pattern visibility on the screen. So this little gratings that I showed you before, this is the, uh, uh, this is the device that the scientists, scientists like, like him uses in the laboratory. And, and he, he, he believes that by, by playing with these little gratings, we can understand something about this, about the, the complex world. Um, so the future, uh, this is how, uh, how uh, a scientist looks at little gratings on the screen. Uh, the future for, the, for, for this scientist uh, belongs to building such maps for solid spaces, finding solid regions of visibility, just like I described. So we put together this project, uh, which we called Vision Science for Dynamic Architecture. And here is the, uh, the vision scientist, the kinetic architect, and uh, designer of, uh, of cinematic experiences. Uh, so here is how we pitched this project to the, uh, to the academy. We talked about built environments that increasingly include moving parts, theaters, concert halls, conference rooms, Educational public buildings, they can be reshaped to match the shape, uh, the, the scale of events and uh, audiences they contain. Design of such dynamic spaces presents unprecedented difficulties because it requires the designer to anticipate the perceptual impact of environments across a wide range of spatial scale, etc. Et, 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 et so the challenge we thought was to understand what happens in the dynamic environment for every location. If you design something for a mobile viewer, or if you design it in a mobile environment, you want to test it, you want to test every possibility, but you cannot really do that because the number of possible sort of relative positions of the viewer of UI and the environment is practically infinite. If you had a model that would predict your experience at every location, you could start beginning to design the environment in full sense of this word. So here is what we did. So uh, let me just skip this and I will, um, I will, I will, uh, I will show you an example of how it is done in the laboratory. So um, in the early days, in the 70s, we would create these gratings on the faces of scopes like this. We would have an observer sitting here. You see this is it's called a head rest and a chin rest at a fixed distance from the screen. And this is essentially a flat surface. And the room is small. And usually it's dark. And we map out what we think describes the perception of the world. Now, when I show this to architects, they would not trust me. They say, this, this is. You, you, this in the dark room, and you want to explain perception. Well, what they do in, uh, for example, in uh, the architecture robotics laboratory at UCLA, they try to simulate experiences on a large scale. They use large scale robotics like this, San Diego Library. 
uh, on a large scale, so here is just one example, and this is the setup we use for this project. Here are two robots, industrial robots, moving on two 10 meter long tracks. Um, for architects, the idea was to create an, an environment where the designer would experience what he designs in the process of creation. We use that in somewhat more limited ends. We put, we attached a screen to one of the robots and a projector to another robot and let them move together. And here is the person sitting and reporting his experiences. Uh, this is a customized environment they created where presentation of images on the screen and movement of robots was completely synchronized. So we could really map out what you could see at every location in that uh, so far limited arrangement. Uh, it was a project that took about a year. There's a little, uh, uh, little movie they put together to describe what we did here, the robot moving behind, behind the cage. It was very secure because robots, the large beasts. <laughs> uh, so we, um, we created a series of experiments in which we mapped out the ability to see things at different distances uh, while the objects were static, the patterns, those gratings, while they were static at different distances and as they were moving. Um, I didn't want to add too, too many uh, scientific plots here. I'll just show you one, one, one example. So here is the example when the screen is moving towards the viewer. So here's the person sitting, looking at the screen and the screen, the robot is moving the screen towards him and then away, going cyclically away and back, away and back. Uh, every second the computer would emit a click, a sound, and the, the observer was instructed to press a button, one button indicating that he could see the pattern, and another button indicating that he could not see the pattern. Uh, so this is the distance to the screen, and this is time of response, and here, is, here are the clicks, here are the responses of the subject going back and forth. The robot would go closer to, 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 to the person in a way, and every, every second the person would click a button to indicate whether he saw it or not. And then for every location, for on this, on this, on this uh, axis of distance, for every location, we counted the number of responses, I saw it. So we could count how visibility of this pattern on the screen depended on the distance. And look what we found, this is just one example. Let's look at the blue curve. Here is the fraction of visible responses from zero to one. One means I saw them all the time. Zero means I didn't see anything. And this is, well, let's look at this. This is the same data shown as a function of distance. Oops. As a function of distance or as a function of spatial frequency, which is density of detail. Because as things move towards you, they become denser. It's the same, uh, the same uh, essentially the same dimension of spatial frequency and distance. So over distance here, uh, he couldn't see anything and then suddenly he saw over the distance of maybe half a meter. This is an example of what I was trying to describe just before as space filled with these chambers. And the, the cha chambers differ from one another in what you can or can, cannot see. So as you go, uh, if you walk towards the object, you couldn't see it and here in the space of maybe half a meter, he would suddenly see it. This is the first example, I think, in the history of the subject that we were able to measure this transition. This is invisible boundary between this, those rooms and that invisible palace that uh, fills any built environment, any space, and this is beginning of mapping out this space. So to conclude, uh, I just want to, uh, to leave you with two things, two, uh, two ideas. One is the solid sensory field, this invisible palace. I think this is a new concept. It's an example of how trying to break uh, how to break interdisciplinary boundaries using new language, creating a new idea. Language can be a vehicle for communication, it could be an obstacle, but it could be a vehicle for creation, and I think together with an architect and, uh, and production designer, we created a new concept, new language for understanding space. And second, I, I think it's time to build. I, um, I understand many people here are involved in creating immersive experiences. Uh, I would love to work with architects, uh, designers of immersive experiences. Uh, please talk to me. Thank you so much.